The next day, John stayed home and took them into the den for some of his own lessons. He had them sit on the chairs in front of his desk and ask them questions about history. Do you know where I learned all these stories? It was in these books. He said so, waving his hand at the bookcases. Are they real, said Bobby? The stories? Some stories are real. Those are history. Some of them aren't real. Those are fiction, or poems, or epics. But good thinking, Bobby. You predicted what I was going to talk about in a way. Sometimes it's hard to tell. Bobby, do you remember when you asked me whether Seth was real? No. You asked. Seth is a god for the Egyptians. He's part of their history, but he's not real. And do you remember Troy? Yes. Well, that was real. But over the years, people started to think it wasn't. Now we know it's partly real, but no one can say how much. Bobby, do you remember what your mother taught you about math three weeks ago? No. Well, she taught you something. What was it? I don't know. But whatever it was, it really happened. Yes. But how do you know if you can't remember it? Because she always teaches us math. So you remember the topic, but not the details. Yes. Well, that's like history and stories. Sometimes the history turns out to be fake, and stories turn out to be real. Some things have real ideas or real lessons, but they aren't true. And other things are real even if you don't remember them. And some are real, even if you don't know them yet. Bobby looked at his feet. You don't have to understand. Look at the pictures on the wall. Do you know who that is? Caesar. And who is that? Brahms. And who is the man on the shelf way up behind you? Bobby turned to see a small picture of a man placed on the shelf at a thoughtless angle, as if it were put there just to get it out of the way. I don't know. John rose and reached up for it. Even he had to stand on his tippy toes. He put the picture in Bobby's lap, and Philip leaned over inquisitively. You are very curious, Bobby, but you've never asked who this is. You never told me. I thought it was just a picture. It's your grandfather, your mother's father. His name was Philip. I know. Bobby scrutinized the picture and said, He has funny clothes. When Bobby looked up, he was startled at the penetrating gaze of his father. John breathed in and said, That's what they wore in those days. Now, Bobby, do you think he's real? Yes. Why? You said so. But have you ever seen him? Can you find him? Do you know what his voice sounded like? No. Would you recognize his watch or his notebooks if you saw them? No. That's right. You have to take my word for it. John sat down behind his desk. Now, he died a long time ago. Does that mean he is real now? No. But history is real. And all the people from history are dead. Bobby looked at him helplessly. If all the people are dead, is the history real? Or is it just a story? I... You don't have to answer. What's more important is, is that without him, there would be no you or Philip. Of course. John paused for a moment at that answer. He is like Troy. He is partly real. You just can't see him anywhere but in that picture. Was he nice? John hesitated. He was generous. Bobby held the picture out. And John put it back. Enough philosophy. 
What would you like to hear about today? It's your choice, and it doesn't have to be hard. How about... Bobby turned and whispered with Philip. How about Curious George? Excellent, Bobby. And good job including your brother in the decision. You really are a nice boy. As his father read, he worked in his own thoughts about history and philosophy. Bobby stared over his shoulder into the woods where the boxes were. As soon as his mother was out of sight the next morning, Bobby went into the garden shed out back, leaving Philip to play in the sand dirt. It was the size of a small barn. He didn't like the shed very much. The smell of rotting grass bothered his nose and eyes, and it was dark and musty. There were tools all around and a couple of empty rooms. Sometimes his father did projects with wood in there. He saw a few squarish slabs this time, perhaps window shutters, and some fresh sawdust. His father did not include him in woodworking projects, but he made things like wagons and seesaws for the boys. The only time he was in there was when he, and later he and Philip, had to hide when someone came to the house. They would peek out the window at whoever came up, invariably a man who would be there to fix something, and they were very careful not to be seen. Bobby took a small pickaxe from the wall and brought it to the edge of the forest, where he dug a small hole. He put it in, covered it with dirt, and concealed the earth with some leaves. Bobby went inside to his mother and asked her a few questions about a book. Then he asked her why she said she would put him in school sometime. If I'm not grown, why would you send me to school? Why would other children be there? His mother said, Don't you remember I said you probably wouldn't have to go to school? But before that, you said I would. Now I don't think you have to. The other children are bad anyway, Bobby. They aren't as nice as you, and they want to steal from you and beat you up. Why would they do that? Please don't ask, she said. It wouldn't be fun at school. His curiosity only grew. What would other boys be like? He had never seen another girl at all, other than Peyton, and she didn't count. There were things he knew were real, even though he had never seen them. They were things he knew were real, even though he had never seen them. He had to take his parents' word for it. What would it be like to see ten or twenty other children. When his father got home and had settled into the den with his pipe, Bobby went to him and asked him quietly if he could go to school, just once, just once to see what it was like. This resulted in a long discussion between his parents in the kitchen. The conversation was heated, but they didn't shout. He tried to listen, but it was dangerous to get close to the door. It could swing open at any moment, and the dining room had nowhere to hide. Still, he heard his father saying that Nancy had to make a decision. That night, he was put to bed without the usual routine, and they kept Philip downstairs and asked him many questions. Bobby could not bear to hear their muffled voices, so he crept to the top of the stairs to listen. They were asking him about history and about books. They also asked him about math and science, and everything else they had been learning. Then they asked if Bobby was being truthful with them. By the long silence Philip gave, Bobby could tell he was struggling not to say anything. He heard his parents thank him, and then they took him upstairs to bed. Bobby pulled the covers up to his chin and turned on his side, pretending to be asleep. He heard the floorboards creak as his mother went to the side of his bed and stood over him. He tried desperately to breathe slowly and not to move his eyelids. She kissed Bobby on the forehead and then whispered a story to Philip. Why aren't our other grandparents in the pictures? asked Bobby as they played gin rummy. 
You sure are growing up fast, said his father, glancing at Nancy. The other ones aren't as important. I mean, you needed them to be born, but Grandfather Philip is the one who made it so we could live here together. Did he make this house? He made this whole life, Bobby. I'll tell you more when you're older. When will I be older? What a strange question. You get older every day. But will I forget it? Bobby's mother had been quieter than usual for a few days, avoiding eye contact and cutting their lessons short. Right now, she fidgeted with her cards, arranging them continually. John spoke again. Bobby, we'll be explaining a lot of things very soon, but now's not the time. Tell me what you read about today. Bobby did so, and Philip joined in enthusiastically. He had been looking back and forth between his father and brother as they spoke, but had not contributed. But he knew exactly what was going on in the book, and he quoted lines from it precisely. Philip, said Bobby as they went up and down the seesaw the next morning, I'm going back into the woods. Again? I have to. But it will be far in, so I can't use string. It's gone, anyway. I might get lost, and if I do, just tell Mommy you were playing and I walked off and you didn't know where I went. Philip had no response for a few cycles up and down on the seesaw. I thought you said it was monsters in the woods. Not exactly. They're really a boy and a girl, but they're kind of monsters. They know who I am but they don't know who you are. Philip needed time to absorb that thought. They just tell me riddles, and I don't understand what they mean. I have to go in and find out. Please don't, Bobby. I don't want to be alone. Neither do I, but I think we will be if I don't go find out more. There's one more monster. He knows us, but I haven't seen him. Why haven't they come out to get us? They are in boxes. I don't know why. If Mommy comes out before I'm back, tell her I saw Butterfly and ran after it and never came back. Keep her from looking for me. Bobby eased the seesaw down and said, Wait here. Or goodbye. I don't know which. But wait, said Philip. You said the last one knows us, but you also said they don't know me. Bobby gasped in frustration with himself. Okay, Philip, I'm sorry. I lied. I told them I had a brother and they knew your name. Or one of them did. I don't know how. But they didn't say anything else about you. You'll be okay, whatever happens to me. You might even be better off. Just stay here and play. The monsters aren't bad. Bobby went to the edge of the forest and got his pickaxe. He closed his eyes and focused. He went straight towards Robertson's box, partially breaking branches on the bushes, so they hung down straight. Before he reached Robertson, he turned left to make a wide semicircle around him and Peyton. The woods were confusing, but he concentrated as hard as he could. He was Odysseus. Stay the course. After a long time, he thought he was past where Peyton was. He walked cautiously toward where the third box should be, and he saw it, a gray, rotting enclosure covered in moss. He crept up on it and waited until he was just a few steps away, then circled around to the front. Inside was what looked like a dead body. The flesh was down to the bone, and the hair was falling out. Its clothes were rotting strips of cloth. Are you alive? Bobby heard a low rasping and saw the chest move up and down. The person, a child, was leaning on the back of the box, but summoned the energy to raise his eyes for a moment. It's you, he said. Who are you? Heh, <laughs> heh. You don't remember... I'm Carlton. The name carried through the air like the smell of a room that one has not entered in many years. 
Please tell me more than Robertson and Peyton. I don't understand them. You're the golden boy, said Carlton. Mommy's favorite. She always chooses you. Chooses? Yes. You're old. Do you have a brother or a sister? I have a brother. It's Philip. <laughs> I'm also your brother. Carlton did not look up, and the effort of speaking made his voice quieter and quieter. How? We are all her children, your brothers and your sister. He took a few breaths. They will choose soon. They will choose you. She will. They always do. Why do they choose? Our mother is not a person. She was, but now... It was our grandfather. He learned how to live forever. He tried to teach her, but she could not learn. But he loved her too much and gave his soul to her. His soul? Now she needs new ones. She took ours. You were the first. She loves you best. She always chooses you. Bobby was silent. Carlton stood up. Looked up. Carlton looked up. <laughs> His laugh was more like a cough. Or does she love your brother more? Is he better? I don't know. Carlton looked up for a slow second. Who gets the white crystals, he will be in a box, just like us. Carlton was fading, but in the resurgence of energy, he said, He will call out to us for weeks. Isn't there something I can do? She can't do that to Philip. She feeds on us, little by little. There must be something to do. You can choose, now that you know. The crystals taste good. You go to sleep. But you wake up here, and Philip will be the golden boy. I'll break you out, he said, raising the pickaxe. Then she'll kill us all. She is not a mother. What about Daddy? By this time, Carlton's eyes had glazed over, and he stopped speaking. Carlton! The boy was motionless. A few gnats swarmed around his hairless skull. Carlton, please! He did not speak. Bobby raised the axe, preparing to bring it down on the box. But he hesitated. He needed a better plan. He started back, this time straight to Peyton's box. But she just snarled at him. Robertson would not look at him and only bleated and bawled. Bobby remembered his way home, and his mind was clear. He had not needed the branches. Philip was still in the backyard alone. He looked up at Bobby and waved. He had just finished a sandcastle that looked just like their house. Good job, Philip. The monsters were nice? Yeah, they were nice. Bobby sneaked inside and hid the pickaxe under his mattress. Nancy waited until after dinner before bathing the boys. She sat next to them on a wooden stool, washing their hair and sponging their shoulders. She sang songs to them, melancholy songs they hadn't heard before. She gave them dinner herself and got them into their pajamas. John appeared and helped them in onto the chair in front of the mirror one by one so he could comb their hair. Where were you, Daddy? said Bobby. I was in the shed building something. Bobby remembered the slabs of wood he had seen. We have something to tell you, boys. They went into the living room, and Bobby and Philip sat on their leather love seat while Nancy and John faced them. This is an important day, said John. And a special one, said Nancy. You've been good brothers to each other, right? They both nodded. John went on. 
We know of you, you have been very good to each other, and you are both very smart. But there are times when we must know the truth. We've been thinking about both of you a lot lately. Well, for a long time, really. Nancy glanced at John, who did not reciprocate. She said, You are both the most beautiful children, and your voices are like the singing of angels. Your brown hair and eyes, Ari, make me faint, and your golden locks and sky-blue eyes make my heart flutter, Philip. Bobby's head snapped back slightly at the word golden. And you were growing to be strong and skilled. We wouldn't want anyone but you, not for any other children in the world. The boys sat patiently. You are both very intelligent, said John, although we have noticed that Philip might be a little more so. How is that, said Bobby. He doesn't understand things. He just repeats them. We have to take into account that he is younger, Bobby. You don't remember yourself at his age. But let's not get into details. We are afraid that you have been lying, Bobby. Nancy broke in. All boys start to lie at a certain age. Maybe so, Nancy. He has, gotten, he's, he has certainly gotten old this time. Bobby quickly said, What do you mean? I... His father cut him off. Nothing, Bobby. You'll understand in the fullness of time. Tonight you are both going to go through a stage in life. We are going to put you to bed, and both of you will wake up tomorrow morning. But one of you will remember this, and this life and one of you will forget. And we thought that you should know, when you wake up, that if you were the one who remembers, this wasn't a mistake. That's why we have explained this. Bobby's heart pounded. He swallowed and frowned in a precursor to tears. Don't worry, Bobby. It's just a stage of life. You'll be okay. Now it's time to say goodbye to each other, because either way, you won't see each other again. Bobby cried, and his hands shook with fear and regret. Philip started to cry, too. Come on, give each other a hug. They got up awkwardly and hugged for a long time. Bobby opened his eyes and saw his mother's face. He looked into his brother's eyes. Philip didn't understand what was going on. Now, upstairs to bed. Mommy has a special drink for you. I'll get them, said John. Nancy led them upstairs, and they lay down under the covers. She sat on Bobby's bed and read them a story, and in a few minutes, John came in with two glasses. They were filled halfway with a green liquid. He put one next to each brother on the bedside table between them and sat down on Philip's bed. These are sweet drinks, said Nancy. They are made with mint. That's why they have a tint of green. Bobby looked closely at his glass and saw tiny bits of white powder at the bottom, like sugar that had not completely mixed in. He forced a smile. John, she said, do shut the window. There's a draft. He leaned over and pulled it down. Philip had to scooch over to make room, and he watched John strain with the lock, which was just within reach and had been painted over and did not close easily. In the same instant, Nancy switched the glasses. Bobby's eyes widened. Now drink up, she said. Philip reached for his glass. Bobby desperately tried to communicate with him through his eyes. He wanted Philip to make a distraction. He kept moving his eyebrows, and Philip squinted quizzically. Then he understood. Ow, he said, reaching down to his ankle. Something bit me. Nancy and John looked under the covers, and Bobby switched the glasses back. There's nothing there, said John. Something bit me. Well, it's gone now. 
Now have your drink. Philip sipped it, then gulped it. That was delicious. Yes, you'll fall asleep now. Now it's your turn, Bobby. May I use the bathroom? John looked annoyed. Very well. Bobby threw the sheets back and hurried into the bathroom. He turned the water on and dawdled there, preparing, focusing. He started hyperventilating, and he could feel tears coming. He could not force himself to look in the mirror. He didn't want to see his fear. He wanted to look brave. A few tears ran down his cheeks. Then he willed them to stop. Come out, Bobby. It's time. He wiped his eyes and looked at himself. His cheeks were red, but his face was straight and calm. He opened the door and went to the space between the beds. His father had moved to the foot of Philip's bed. Philip was asleep. His mother was at the foot of Bobby's bed. Okay, he said. He climbed into bed, took the glass, sipped it, and put it down. Make sure you drink all of it, Bobby, said John. Bobby finished it. Then he lay down and allowed his eyes to close, pretending to fall asleep while he tried with all his might to stay alert. He pretended he was in the forest. Concentrate. Stay the course. His parents stood up. His mother was weeping. Goodbye, Ari, she said. Bobby heard the floorboards creaking and the clack of the door closing. The moment they were downstairs, Bobby reached under his mattress for the pickaxe, opened the window, and slid down to the porch roof and from there to the yard. Already feeling dizzy, he ran for the woods. Luckily, the moon was bright, but he was unsure of his footing and he kept losing focus. He had to make it to Robertson's box. Another few dozen steps in, and he didn't know where he was. He spun around and couldn't even see the lights from the house. Robertson! Robertson! He heard a bleeding off to his right, and he made his way there. As soon as he got there, he smashed the door to the box, breaking it off its hinges. You'll die, said Robertson. No, I won't. We have to save Philip. We have to get out of here. But first we need the others. Help me find them. Robertson crawled from the box, eyes darting left and right. He stood and stretched as tall as his bent back would allow. Let's go, said Bobby. We have to go fast. I drank it. Robertson hobbled along with Bobby, keeping him on a straight path. They reached Peyton and broke her free, too. She stood up unsteadily, dazed. Then they got to Carlton's box and broke him out. He couldn't walk, so Bobby put him on his back, even as he got dizzier and dizzier. The four of them hobbled back toward the house, but they were soon unsure of the direction. Follow me, said Bobby. He went back toward Carlton's box and then found the branches he had broken the last time. By the light of the moon, they were able to follow their trail until they could see lights from the house filtering between the tree trunks. They broke into the yard and collapsed. Bobby's eyelids felt like hammers were tied to them, and his eyes were crossing against his will. Carlton whispered into his ear, Get up. We have to stop her. Bobby struggled to his hands and knees. There is only one way, Bobby. You have to get her outside. We'll do the rest. Okay. Carlton climbed off Bobby's back and, miraculously invigorated, stood and said strongly, Bobby, are you angry? I don't know. You can't soften when you see her. She is not our mother, not anymore. No mercy. Bobby was uncertain. Try to remember, said Carlton. Try to remember something about us. Remember Robertson. He's the last one you knew. As if peering into a swimming pool, Bobby started to see wavy memories he had never known. He had been in bed across from Robertson. Robertson wasn't good-looking enough, 
and he couldn't run well. Earlier, it had been Peyton. She was just a girl, and it had to be a boy. Carlton was all things except for one. She just didn't like him. She couldn't say why. She just didn't. He remembered how she had given each one of the others a last kiss at dawn, but when she did, she grabbed them with claw-like hands and bit into their necks. Their life drained away, and they would look dead when his father came in to take them away and put them in the box. And then he would sleep and awaken with bright eyes, eager for the day, and a few years later, the next would be born. But now he remembered all the pain of seeing that last embrace and missing them, and he remembered the anger, anger which had been robbed of him so he would come downstairs later that morning as Nancy's golden boy. He looked at Carlton and sighed deeply. Then he crawled to the window in the den and peered in. His mother was looking at the ground. He scratched the window lightly, and she looked up. Her mouth, mouth, her mouth fell open in shock, and she ran to the window. Ari, what are you doing here, my poor boy? Her voice was insincere to Bobby. It was dripping with falsehood. Bobby ran into the darkness and hid behind the shed. He heard someone hammering something together inside. He also heard Nancy run through the house, fling open the porch door, and run into the backyard. Ari, where are you? He stepped out from behind the shed. There are some people here to see you. They know you, too. He pointed at the other three figures. She stood, her mouth opening and shutting. You tried to kill Philip. No, I saved you. Those glasses, one was poison, and, and you changed them, I know. And you were going to put Philip in the box. I know what you do. And you know what I did? I changed them back. Nancy breathed in sharply. Oh, no, Bobby. And now I want to know something else. Who is Daddy? Her mouth deepened into a terrifyingly exaggerated frown. Her eyes seemed to sink into her head. Who is he? My father. Our grandfather? Is he a person? He is better than a person. So are you, Ari. And I chose you. When you grow up, you'll never let me grow up. You just do this again and again, and I forget. But this time I remembered. I remembered their names. Now I remember everything. Bobby saw her fingers bend like claws. The others started coming toward her, Robertson limping, Peyton crawling, and Carlton, having fallen again, barely dragging himself along. He walked toward her with the pickaxe. Don't move. Please no, Ari. Tell them to stop. The others gained speed. Nancy turned to run, but Bobby struck her ankle with the axe, and she fell, shrieking. The others jumped upon her with a sudden burst of energy, and they scratched her and bit her neck. She was stunned for a moment, but then started to rise up and grab at them with black fingernails. Bobby stood over her with the pickaxe. His father burst out of the shed. But then it was not his father. It was his grandfather, exactly as he appeared in the picture. As he walked, he started stumbling and then fell on the grass. Bobby went toward him, and he could see that his face was shriveling up. Then it started steaming and falling off onto the ground. Bobby looked away. Then he fell to his knees and cried. He could hear his mother scream, but the scream became that of a demon. He peeked out only once, and her body was turning into red-hot coals. His brothers and sister had let go of her and were lying on the grass, gasping for breath. After a few minutes, all became silent, and he took his hands away from his face. 
standing where their mother had been were his siblings, all fresh-faced, smiling, and healthy. They were still the same age as when they had been put in the box, four or five years old. He looked back toward his grandfather, and what he saw in his place was John laying face down, lying face down on the grass. He went over and shook his shoulder, but he was unconscious. The four of them dragged him inside and put him on the couch. They drew close together but didn't know what to say. The three from the woods had never seen each other. The only one they knew was Bobby. They sat Indian style in a tight circle, their knees touching, and they started to talk. They talked about all the times they had spent with Bobby, who remembered what they were saying as if they talked everything back to life. How did you come back? said Bobby. Carlton answered, I don't know. It felt like my soul came back to me from the coals. What happened to our real mommy? Peyton knew. Grandfather Philip found the secret from a demon. Your soul disappears into it. It doesn't eat it? Robertson said, No. It tortures it. That's all. It lives on pain. We can't tell Philip what happened, said Bobby. He's too young. They agreed, and then they talked about normal things again. Bobby wondered to himself why the crystals hadn't put him to sleep. He guessed it must have been all the excitement. But the very thought of sleep made Bobby tired, and he lay down on the floor. The others did too, and even as they kept talking, at some undefinable time, they drifted off. Bobby? It was John. Bobby sat up suddenly with terror in his eyes. Don't worry, it's me. Before, your grandfather controlled me. Controlled you? Yes. Your mother's father took me over one day. It's hard to explain, because I did things that I wanted sometimes, but it was as if I was just watching myself do things. I knew what was happening, but I couldn't control it. Everything, like the things I taught you, were from me, but they were not the things I would have said to you. I didn't mean to do all those things over the years. Are you really my real daddy? Yes, really real. And their daddy, he said, pointing at the others, who were still sound asleep. I remember making the box, and then I came out of the shed, and then everything faded away. You melted. I melted? Gosh. But that was really Grandfather Philip. The next thing I knew, I woke up with all my children here, all my beloved children, and now everything I do is what I want to do, and I will never betray you, any of you, ever. Will he come back? No. And I will burn his notebooks. I don't remember where they are, but I'll find them. Bobby nudged Robertson, who awoke with a little scream. That woke up the others, who also leaped to their feet with fright. I didn't know where I was, said Peyton. I haven't woken up without pain in forever, said Clayton. John explained to them what he had told to Bobby, and they all hugged. Let's get Philip, he said. We'll all go together. Philip was amazed to wake up with four children standing around him, and he looked back and forth like a scared rabbit. Hi, Philip, said Clayton, giving a little wave. Philip gasped and hugged Bobby like he was a life boy. They all laughed. Bobby said, These are the monsters I was talking about. Monsters? They all laughed again. Not really, said Bobby. They're your brothers and your sister. You'll get to know them now. We're all together now. Where's Mommy? She had to go on a trip. It's a long trip. I'll tell you when she's coming back. She said she was sorry she couldn't say goodbye, but she had to go. Philip frowned. Don't worry, Philip. It's okay, really. We just have to get by without her for a while. John put some breakfast together, fried eggs with broken yolks, and a hodgepodge of whatever else was in the refrigerator. 
This is my best effort, gang. I think we'll need a nanny. It's like 10,000 Thanksgivings, said Robertson. The new siblings were most interested in Philip and bombarded him with attention. John broke into the conversation to say, I think next Monday would be a good time to go to school. That will give you some time to get to know each other better, and I'll stay home from work till then. They had all the same questions as Bobby had before. Do they look like us? Are there girls? Is it easy? The hardest thing will be how to explain how I suddenly have five children to bring to school, said John. But I have a little magic of my own, and it has nothing to do with demons. Not real ones, anyway. What? said Bobby. I'm a lawyer. None of them laughed or even knew what he meant. I'll have to do the same kind of thing you've done the last few days, Bobby. What's that? Figure things out one step at a time.